It's hot out there, but let's blow them off the line of scrimmage. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory. What do snow-smothered Buffalo, New York, and sunny San Diego, California have in common? Certainly not the weather. San Diego enjoyed its usual balmy temperatures last Sunday, as the Chargers had a chance to clinch their first playoff spot in 14 years. Failing that, they at least wanted to remain one game ahead of their nearest division rivals, the snowbound Denver Broncos, who were visiting Buffalo, a team with playoff aspirations of its own, as the NFL season entered its 14th week with 19 of its 28 teams still in contention for postseason play. Though snow plows swept the artificial surface of Buffalo's rich stadium clean, sub-freezing temperatures kept the playing field rock hard. In a hard-fought game with both teams fighting for playoff berths, the weather conditions would play a vital role. The Bills were a team that had unexpectedly snuck up on the rest of the league, having won four straight games. With a record of 7-6, and six, they harbored an outside hope of making the playoffs. Though both the Bills and Broncos are cold-weather teams, from the outset of the game, it was vividly apparent the biting cold would take its toll. The Broncos' Larry Canada fumbled on Denver's first offensive series, but it mattered not a whit, for Buffalo gave the ball right back. Four fumbles occurred in the first quarter alone and the amazing total of 11 for the entire game as both teams' offenses couldn't get on track. quarter of this game more and more appeared like an unrehearsed and ragged comedy routine. This lullaby of errors lulled some of the 38,000 fans in the stands, for with one exception it appeared the quarter would end in a scoreless tie. The one exception occurred when the Bills fumbled at the Broncos 10 and linebacker Tom Jackson, number 57, stepped over Joe Ferguson's tackle and returned the gift all the way to the Buffalo 20. Even then, the game remained at zero when the Bills refused any further advancement or interspersed among a myriad of mistakes, some rock-ribbed defensive play was taking place. Led by Randy Gratishar, it was no surprise that Denver defense was dishing it out. What was unexpected was the furious gang tackling by Buffalo's defensive platoon as both teams battled on the frozen tundra of Orchard Park. Coach Chuck Knox's influence on this young Bill defense was apparent as Craig Morton was sacked twice. Denver had ranked second in the league in pass protection. Joe Ferguson bit the dust two times as both defenses controlled the early tempo of the game. Finally, the Denver defense forced a break that led to the first scoring in the game. Late in the first quarter, near the threshold of his own end zone, Bills quarterback Joe Ferguson had a pass deflected over the middle that Denver's Joe Rizzo managed to grab. It gave the Broncos a first down on the Buffalo's 17. On the first snap, Craig Morton was unable to spot a receiver, and the slow-footed quarterback legged it right up the middle for 10 yards with an additional five tacked on for a personal foul against Buffalo. With a first down at the Bill Five, Morton tried a bootleg left, but number 26 cornerback Charles Romes tackled Morton at the line of scrimmage. Denver settled for Jim Turner's field goal from the 13, but the scoreless tie had been broken and Denver led three to nothing. It remained so until midway into the second period when another fine defensive play became the key to the end zone. Number 22, Buffalo's strong safety Steve Freeman was the man of the moment here. 
The five-year veteran from Mississippi State stepped in front of Morton's sideline pass and ran 50 yards for the Bills' first score of the day. With time running out in the first half and Buffalo fans yelling for more, the Bills went on a two-minute drill that beat the clock with a field goal that increased their lead to seven points. At the start of the second half, Joe Ferguson, the leading passer in the American Conference, took his team all the way to the Denver Nine with his short passing game. But with first and goal at the nine, Ferguson pitched out to Curtis Brown, who fumbled in heavy traffic. Denver's middle linebacker, Randy Gratishar, picked up the ball and alertly lateral to Lewis Wright, number 20. The speedy cornerback ran away from the crowd to complete an 86-yard play. However, the extra point was missed, so Buffalo still prevailed 10-9. With eight minutes left in the third quarter, the Bronco attack, which had been held to 68 yards total offense to this point, finally exploded. Craig Morton had detonated a 46-yard bomb to Haven Moses for the first big offensive play of the day. The Bills had blitzed on the pass, but Morton in the classic response stepped up into his pocket and threw a perfect spiral to Moses who made a fine catch in the end zone. For the Broncos' Haven Moses, it was a triumphant return to the city where his pro career began. The pass put Moses over the 7,000-yard receiving mark for his career. Down now by six, the Bills came roaring back on the passing of Ferguson to number 89, Lou Pacone. Pacone is an interesting story. Having been deemed expendable by the Jets, the 30-year-old vet from West Liberty State College has found a home in Buffalo. This season, he's replaced injury-prone Bob Chandler and has shocked everyone by averaging nearly 17 yards a catch. Here, Ferguson escaped to find Pacone for 22 yards. On the day, he would catch three for a total of 60 yards receiving. Just when it appeared Buffalo was coming back, Ferguson went over the middle for his tight end, Reuben Gant, but had the ball picked off by linebacker Bob Swenson. Luckily for Buffalo, Denver had been offsides on the play and the Bills retained possession. Unluckily for them, however, Gant, their big tight end from Oklahoma State, was injured on the play and left the field through for the day. Another casualty in this extremely hard-hitting and hard-fought ballgame. During the drive, Joe Ferguson became the first Buffalo quarterback to pass for over 3,000 yards in one season, but he was unable to get his team into the end zone. The Bills called upon Nick Mickemeyer for a 32-yard field goal, which cut the Broncos' margin to three points. With their fans beseeching them for more, the Bills returned to the scoreboard again when Mickemeyer booted one through from 34 yards. It tied the game at 16 with just two minutes left to play. Assuming the Bills could continue to contain the Denver attack, it appeared certain this game would go into sudden death overtime. With time winding down to a precious few, Buffalo did hold on one series of downs, but with only 18 seconds showing on the clock, Buffalo had to punt, and the Broncos had one more crack at victory. A fine throw by Morton and an even finer catch by number 81, rookie receiver Steve Watson from Temple accounted for 34 big yards and a first down inside Bill territory. 
Eight seconds left now, and Morton lofted a pass to Moses, who stepped out of bounds, stopping the clock with three seconds at the Buffalo 11. Morton had taken his team 40 yards in just 15 seconds. The feed was just 11 yards away as the crowd sat silent, waiting for Jim Turner's field goal try. The 16-year veteran proved immune to pressure as his kick won the game for Denver, ending Buffalo's dreams of the playoffs and sending the Broncos into a tie with San Diego for first place in the AFC Western Division. There was a championship frenzy in San Diego as the Chargers honed in on their first title in 14 years. Victory this Sunday seemed to be a lock for the Lightning Bolts, since they faced an Atlanta Falcon team that had long since lost its playoff pulse. However, the downtrodden Falcons refused to play the role of a doormat. A textbook perfect lead block by rookie William Andrews, number 31, sprung open the door to six points for number 24, Haskell Standback, as the Falcons grabbed the upper hand early. With the Falcons' secondary laying back deep in deference to the Chargers' speedy wide receivers, Dan Fouts exploited the coverage by throwing underneath to his setbacks. Fouts is an opportunist, and when the opportunity to strike long presented itself, he lobbed a perfect strike to Charlie Joyner, number 18. Two plays later, the Chargers goal line battering ram, Hank Bauer, crushed over from the one to tie the game at seven. The Falcons secondary, which is considered worse than suspect, allowed Fouts and John Jefferson to play a simple game of pass and catch. Unfortunately for the Chargers, a definite scoring possibility was blunted when setback Mike Thomas dropped a sure touchdown from Fouts. The Falcons' steady diet of losses this season has not been the result of a lack of effort on their part. Their excellence lies in the hands and legs of their wide receivers, Wallace Francis and Alfred Jenkins, number 84. Jenkins is the lightest starting player in pro football, but one of the toughest to contain. He excels at turning short passes into long games or gliding effortlessly deep for the bomb. Another look at Jenkins' catch reveals the protection afforded quarterback Steve Bartkowski, something he has sorely lacked throughout the 1979 season. Jenkins' 41-yard gain set up the Falcons nicely at the Chargers' 11. From there, Bartkowski and William Andrews combined for the go-ahead touchdown. Andrews' score gave Atlanta a 14-10 lead. Four points seemed easily erasable as Atlanta possessed the NFC's worst pass defense, and the Chargers owned the most prolific passing offense in the entire NFL. Chargers' drive for a score was rudely aborted when cornerback Roland Lawrence, number 22, stole the ball off the hip of Charlie Joyner. 
At 5'9", Lawrence is the incredible shrinking man of a smallish and beleaguered Falcon secondary. However, his pickpocket theft of Joyner preserved Atlanta's lead at the half and caused an already uptight Don Coriel to think about breaking out his worry beads. Incredibly, the Chargers duplicated Lawrence's sleight of hand in the third quarter when cornerback Willie Buchanan, number 28, stole the ball from the Falcons' Dennis Pearson. Although Buchanan has lost his step since his halcyon years with the Green Bay Packers, he has cemented a Chargers secondary that was a liability in past seasons. Fouts wasted little time with formalities like running the football. Instead, he whistled a touchdown pass to rookie John Floyd, number 86. A second look at Floyd's touchdown illustrates the touch of Fouts, who lofted the ball perfectly over the nickelback and inside the coverage of Rick Bias, number 38. The touchdown catch by Floyd returned the lead to the Chargers 17-14. Usually at this stage of the game, Atlanta begins to crumble and fold. But their fortunes found wings when Barkowski split the Chargers with a 41-yard touchdown pass to Wallace Francis. The lead seesawed back to Atlanta 21-17. But with both defenses unable to contain much of anything the offenses tried, it appeared the last team to have the ball would win the game. The Falcons committed a grievous error when Rick Bias interfered with Charlie Joyner at the goal line. The surprise player for the Chargers all season has been their unheralded setback, Clarence Williams, number 40. With the flow of the play going in one direction, Williams bolted over the unprotected side of the Falcon defense. Williams' 11th rushing score of the season returned the lead to the Chargers 24-21. Suddenly, for the first time in the game, the Charger defense, which has grown into a fearsome unit, began to assert itself. When Bartkowski sought out his underused tight end, Jim Mitchell, he found number 51, linebacker Woodrow Lowe, instead. theft was the first of two key plays made by the Chargers defense. The second happened moments later when Bartkowski was trapped in his end zone by Wilbur Young. The safety beefed up the Charger lead to 26 to 21 and with two minutes left in the game San Diego began the countdown to a playoff berth and reminded everyone that they were unquestionably the best in the West. The celebration proved premature as Atlanta launched a well-conceived two-minute drill featuring the runs of William Andrews and the precision passing of Steve Bartkowski. Bartkowski resisted the temptation to impulsively go for broke. Instead, short throws to Billy Rickman and Wallace Francis brought Atlanta within range of the winning score. Don Coriel sensed the inevitable, which came with 29 seconds left on the clock and the Falcons on the Chargers' six-yard line. From there, Bartkowski exploited the single coverage on Wallace Francis. Instead of laying down dead, the gutsy Falcons kept the Chargers out of the playoffs for a week at least, 
and gave Don Coryell what he called his most sickening defeat ever. Bartkowski is much maligned for his lack of poise and a total absence of mobility. But when he is protected, his touch is as pure as Dan Fouts, and the result just as devastating. The Falcons had played their role as spoilers well and received a well-deserved 28-26 victory.